Hey, you lumpy bards and bardettes. Welcome back to I Cast Vicious Mockery. I'm Austin. I'm Matt. I want to talk about spies. He told me that. He was like, hey, what's an adjective that's like a spy? Yeah. And I, I was like, ah, uh, ooh, I can't think of it. And then he was like, I got it. Yeah. And then he said lumpy. <laughs> well, duh. I mean, if you're going to go in somewhere in like a cat suit, right? Yeah. Where, where do you keep all your stuff? Uh, in like a knapsack. No, you can't keep all your stuff in a knapsack. That'll hang down and trigger the lasers. You need to keep it all in your cat suit and then you're going to be lumpy. You're not going to look like you're not going to look like Black Widow. She got those clean lines going from the like nicely tailored cat suit. Mm -mm, nope. Not you, my friend. You're going to be lumpy as heck. It is nicely tailored. Yeah, it's very it's. uh, I don't know. It, it's really designed to impress Okay, so no spoilers from the Black Widow movie here. Did I'm you watch it? I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, me too. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we talked about it. Did we? Yeah. Oh. Um, we both agreed that like it was too actiony. That's right. We did talk about it. Yeah. Um, okay. I was gonna say, when do I see you other than this show? But that's right. We played D and D. That's true too. No, but it was. I think it was before our last episode we recorded. Oh, it was before, it was, the it was, last it was before we recorded though. It was before we recorded. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, uh, isn't it weird? To, is it weird to you at all that she like she like finds that one outfit in a duffel bag? I mean, I guess it was hers technically. But there were two outfits in it and they fit her and the other girl perfectly. That's weird, right? I didn't notice that. I like I didn't see that part of it, I guess. You didn't you didn't notice it when 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 their outfits changed from black to white. Yeah, I know that they did that. I yeah. knew that they changed. I just didn't realize that there were just two in a duffel bag. So I thought they just stole them from. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. Where would they have stolen them from? Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> OK, then. Well, yeah, it was like her. It was like one of uh, N Natasha Romanoff's. B bug out bag things that she had stowed away somewhere and it just happened to have two outfits i mean I it makes feel sense like they're all close to the same size and it probably has to do with like the whole breeding and training program so we can probably explain it that way right right because it's all about the red room and all that stuff the yeah. movie the movie is mm -hmm. about that stuff right um but yeah i agree it was too actiony it wasn't even that it was too actiony it was like this is a supposed to be a spy movie, mm -hmm. but there's explosions and like s crazy stuff, like s too much stuff gets, the they get into like four car accidents that should have killed a normal person, but they yeah. all just kind of walk out of it unscathed. They're highly trained. To survive car accidents. Apparently, yeah. Yeah. Highly trained to survive car accidents. Where do I get that training? <laughs> um, you already have it, apparently. That's true. So the uh, for context for you guys, his car has been smashed by a Hummer before. Did you know they're making a bigger Hummer? Oh, of course they are. It's electric. Yes. Zero to 60 in three seconds. Yep. Which is sports car level. Yep. Weighs 9,000 pounds. Uh, I'm sure it does. Yeah. That's I think a dangerous that's half combo. A bus? I'm not sure. I didn't really look it up. That it's it's a dangerous combination. Zero to yeah. sixty in three seconds and weighs nine thousand pounds. Yeah, yeah. I, that's gonna. Oh my god, that's gonna mess a lot of people up. Because, oh, do you know what it does though? That's really cool. Yeah. This is now on a different note, I, and I think it would be good for where we live with all the snow. Yeah. It can crab walk. Yes, I yes, I've heard that it can do that. I think it's. I think the utility that they had in mind was for parallel parking. Oh, yeah, you would need it for that. It's also for like off-roading, though. Like if, if you're in a oh, crevice or something, you know, like yeah. you, you can't turn the car around certain turns, but you can. A crab walking in a car is when the back wheels also turn. So yes. the whole car, like the wheels just turn and you can drive the car like sideways at low speeds. Or maybe they'll be able to override it and you'll be able to go zero to 60 in three seconds at full speed. 
<laughs> Wait, can you turn the wheels Straight in opposite sideways. directions so that you can just spin? <laughs> <laughs> Like one of those at fireworks. Six, yeah, at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> In three seconds, just... Yeah. <laughs> now, back on the topic of spying. Yes, okay, spies. <laughs> yeah. Um, something that I can probably confirm by watching some spy movies. Yeah. A thing I was thinking of is that stealth missions are only good if stuff goes wrong sometimes. Yeah, of if course. If everything goes perfectly... It's not a good stealth mission. How do we make stuff go wrong, though? There are there are ways to do it. But how do we do it? Okay, so part of these things usually is the reconnaissance part, right? Okay, yeah. So whatever information... First of all, it's good to give... You, your players need enough information that they can actually make a plan. Right. That has like reasonable certainty to be successful okay so you have to be able you have to give them avenues to be able to gather information on their target whatever it is right um so then the way that you make things go wrong is you include something somewhere during the mission quote unquote that they didn't learn about ahead of time and didn't mm -hmm. prepare for. Okay, that's that's a good start. So that that already has me thinking a couple of things. Right, it, it could be anything. Number one is, and don't overuse this, because uh, th this one you have to be the most careful with, but you have to do it at least once sometime. False information. Yeah. You've got to give them a map that's wrong. You've got to, you know, give them, you got you got to tell them timings that are not, you know, for that day or something like that, you know, um, like normally that would be right. But, oh, actually, it's a holiday. The guards change at a different time. Uh -oh. Exactly. I was going to say not even that the information was wrong. The information that they got maybe is right. Yeah. But there are extenuating circumstances. Right. That change it. Yeah. And so, you know, that's a good thing to uh, to to do. Um, the other thing is make it. Well, yeah, kind of like that. Make it so things can can change uh, in, in a way that's. You, you need the situation to respond to the to the players. Right. In, in a stealth mission. Um, and now, actually, let, we, we've got Mark Brown from Game Maker's, Game Maker's Toolkit, Toolkit. To thank for this. You want to have different states of alertness. For whatever the players are trying to infiltrate or steal or whatever they're trying to do, right? Different states of alertness for the guards and the other, you know, people of, uh, of importance. And that includes, you know, if the player has been seen or sensed, right? Or if just a sound was heard, you know, and they're just generally alert, or if they are aggressive or not aggressive yet you know those sorts of things you kind of you kind of can do some of that with um just like feeling it out but you can do some of it with mechanics too right. um like if you were approaching somewhere in broad daylight and a guard saw you they're gonna have a different attitude to if they saw you in the middle of the night right like That's it, true. during the middle of the day there's, you know, other people are seeing this happen. Like they're not gonna, they're not gonna be as aggressive sometimes unless it's required of them. Whereas at night, yeah, they are gonna be pretty aggressive. They're already gonna be on one level of alertness, right? They're they're gonna yeah, start out one start level out, up. So yeah, they're, they're, up, not, yeah. they're like relaxed is is you know at the bottom, and then there's kind of generally alert, and then there's alert to a specific phenomenon, like a specific sound or thing that they see or smell or whatever, you know? And then there's like alert to like an event, right? Like they're suspecting this is a breach, right? They're suspecting that this is, you know, so something is, is off here and, and it's malicious. 
instead of just like, was that a, was that a skunk? I hope, I hope that wasn't a skunk. And they look around to see if it was because they don't want to get sprayed by a skunk. Right. We have, we have a skunk who lives next to our house, I think. Uh oh. It's great because the air conditioners are on that side. So if the that's sk- where the skunk lives. Yeah. Oh, it, it, it doesn't have to spray. It just smells bad. I think when it sleeps or something. Or it like sprays the ground or something like that. Sk- skunks just, they just smell bad? No, not, not generally, but they, they do something that isn't spraying enemies that is smelly. Because it smells like skunk very frequently here. Very, like every other day or more. Like there are there are like one or two days a week in the morning where it doesn't smell like skunk. It's awful. Well, let's Thankfully, hope, the smell dissipates. Over yeah, the let, of the let's day. hope that basket doesn't get a hold of. The- <laughs> well, she got sprayed once. That's well. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, I'm hoping she catches it and just kills it already. I, we've seen it on camera. It's not that big. She could fight it. She just probably get sprayed and lose because she's not very good at fighting i thought that but doesn't all she all she wants to do is get the squirrels though right yeah and chipmunks and chipmunks yeah yeah well that's what she's bred for right the small little guys she'll go for anything up to the size of a deer (laughs) (laughs) well up to but not including like we've, we've run into deer down down the street yeah and she just like looks at it and is like, what? What are you doing? Yeah. What are you, who are you? What kind of <laughs> shape is that? You're not a squirrel. <laughs> That's not something I was bred to fight. Yeah. So she kind of just like leaves it alone, which is good because otherwise she'd probably spook it and get kicked. So uh, another thing to include with spy stuff. Yeah. Is maybe even some of the opposite. Stuff that they were expecting to be an obstacle, but maybe goes like really well in their favor by circumstance too. Mm -hmm. Because that stuff can happen. Yeah. Maybe they expected they have to deal with his guard, but uh uh-oh, he partied a lot the night before and he's asleep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. At his post, you know? Um, And and so the other thing uh is that it should, it should be partially up to the player's skill but also partially beyond their control. Yes. We, we don't want them to just be like, oh, well, my dexterity is, is 20. I have this uh, spell that gives me plus 10 to dexterity or stealth checks. Oh, yeah, yeah, stealth checks is the one. What, yeah, uh, password failure. trace, yeah. Yeah, there's another one too, something of shadows or whatever. Oh, it, no, that's a cleric, um, domain of trickery cleric thing. Yes, Pass Without Trace is a spell Mm -hmm. that gives you plus 10 to stealth checks. The cleric thing is a divine whatever it's called. You know, those guys. Uh, Yeah, one of those divine whatever it's called. Divine things. Yeah. And it just, you know, it just boosts your uh, stealth scores by 10, which is really good, but also the scores of anybody within... 30 or 60 feet of you who you want right which is i think the same as that's what Pass Without trace Trace does yeah yeah so it's like yeah equally good but you only get it you you get it every day like one or two or something that's not bad anyway uh that that should be part of the equation but the other thing is that it shouldn't all be you know based on how stealthy they are or not um and you got to be a little careful with it, but like there should be some dice rolls going on to determine like, hey, maybe you guys just run into something and it's just going to be a problem. Right. Because it's like if there's a guard standing directly in front of a door, mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter how stealthy you are. Mm-hmm. You can't just open the door and walk past them. Yeah. Well, that and, you know, you no matter how many eyes you think you have, you can't see everything all the time. That's true, too. So you don't know if somebody's following you or, you know, heard you or whatever. And the obstacles don't even have to be sentient. They could be there. I mean, if there's something worth protecting, then there probably are traps 
or or at least alarms. The traps yeah. don't even have to do anything bad. Right. In fact, if there are guards patrolling around, chances are almost all of the traps are going to be to alert them. Exactly. Not to like cause yeah, like damage. Yeah, one, like one alarm uh, bell rings and they know, you know, this door was opened or whatever, things like that. Yeah, that, right. that's exactly it. And um, well, I guess the other part of it is you, you want to telegraph w- s- most of the obstacles. All of the obstacles? Most of the obstacles. Hmm. You want to let players know enough that uh, they can they can expect it and try to do something about it, even if that whatever they try to do fails. Yeah. And we, but we do want some failures. Right. We do want that. We want things to go wrong or else it just isn't exciting. If everything goes right, uh, there is tension, but there's not excitement. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Is there even tension? I mean, after like... There could be, but... Yeah, there isn't necessarily tension. If everything goes right the whole time... I don't know, though. If I was playing a game of D&D and everything went exactly right... Mm-hmm. And like You'd I be walked, worried that... Uh, yeah. Like like it was too easy. Yeah. And then yeah. I'd be like, is this like, is this like a fake thing that I just stole? Mm-hmm. Or <laughs> like... Which it could be, but... Right. Um, that's not a bad idea actually like yeah it's not a make it really like it it goes without a hitch it's really easy but then it turns out it was a uh it was a scam it it was was, a prank it was a and you're uh, on somebody's youtube channel now ashton kutcher comes out of nowhere comes out of nowhere and he's like yeah he's like you got punked (laughs) he comes out of nowhere and he's like meteor shower uh, uh you can do that for sure meteor swarm yeah yeah meteor swarm that's it yeah where it does like i know all i remember is that half the damage is fire and half the damage is bludgeoning mm-hmm. and it's insane it's like yeah. over a large area it's it's a ba- it's a big yeah. big boy but anyway um i don't know how m- Yeah, I guess imagine if because of your amazing stealth score, everything just goes really smoothly for you. I, I feel like that's not a great stealth mission, you know, like like even unless unless you can do it so quickly. Right. Like if, if the players are standing there deliberating about stuff for a long time. I would make that even if my original plan was to make it easy and make them succeed, I would change the plan there. Because they're they're putting in the the effort and they're going to get no reward from it unless i unless i change the plan at that point you know what i mean like unless i make it something where they actually do have to react to obstacles and uh things do go wrong for them they're just going to they're just going to breeze through it and it'll be all this tension that they have and all this like planning and stuff that is that it turns out is pointless i don't know if that feels the best yeah and you know and and i don't know it's sort of like getting to a secret area in a video game by accident you know and and then there's nothing there or not even by accident but you like see it no like on purpose you you see an area and you're like can i get there and you try really hard and you do get there and it's just like empty there there wasn't really any point or it's just like an easter egg but like you You know easter eggs are worth it every time Worth it every time. Don't even try that. Don't even try to tell me that. But what if you don't understand what the reference is? Um, hmm. You can look it up online. That's what I always did. Actually, back in the day, when I played Sly 2, I had the strategy guide. We've talked Mm -hmm. about this before. Yeah. And um, the strategy guide explained all of the Easter eggs in the game. (laughs) And... When I saw them in the strategy guide, I purposefully played through the game again just so I could go look at all the Easter eggs and be like, by golly, there it is. <laughs> Were you like, I know what that means. It's actually. <laughs> uh, um, That was the name of the studio before they called it Sucker Punch. <laughs> <laughs> it was called Egg Splat or whatever. I don't remember what the <laughs> Easter egg was, but it was on a grid. I remember that it was it was on the level where you have to 
beat the Contessa, but like the second one. Mm -hmm. And there was a graveyard somewhere and one of the gravestones had a name on it that had something to do with the studio that sucker punch the the name the studio was called sucker punch but they had a different name before that right and it had something to do with that now remember that yeah it was one of the easter eggs we can talk about easter eggs in dnd sometime how do you even do that how do you even do that uh that sounds well, I think like the belt of the hawk you know that item the belt like of the it hawk. gives you it, yeah. i forget what it ga- gives you like super high dexterity and everyone says you look like the guy who has the belt of the hawk uh, yeah that, yeah that deal um but you just don't tell the players what it's called but eventually they might uncover it and realize that oh that was based on tony hawk the whole time <laughs> that kind of thing oh yeah 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 so that's that's how you do it uh an easter egg there um that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Man. Yes. For, for stealthy stuff, though. Okay. What are some good ways of having things go wrong without, like, com- your cover's completely blown? Well, number one, okay, so number one is to keep in mind the different levels of alertness from relaxed all the way up to aggressive. And yes. then there's like all this stuff in between. In Game Maker's Toolkit, Mark Brown did an episode on stealth games and he talks about a couple of different levels of this. But like real people are on a, you know, sliding scale. It's not, it's not like it's, uh, they're on like a spectrum of this. They're on like a gradient of this. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, well, well, I think, first of all, I think if it gets to like an aggressive alertness. Right. It's it no longer a stealth. It's no longer a stealth mission. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. We can't skip to that last step. You now that's one that's that's the thing. Like players have to know first off that full aggression is going to be a problem. That problem could come in multiple forms. Um the problem could be that, you know, their objective will be taken if that happens. Mm-hmm. The problem could be that they will die. They, they're going into this place completely outnumbered and it doesn't matter that they're the strongest things in the in the world right now or whatever because that's how players usually are what right. what matters is they're going up against like 50 people who know this place who can you know drop stuff on them from the roof or whatever you know things like that right like they're, they're gonna have a hard time and you know these people are are like they're they're paid to protect maybe, maybe not even paid maybe they're just super loyal or something you know you don't even know the situation that has them there maybe they are loyal and they'll fight to the death because they believe in whatever this thing is that you're trying to steal you know yeah maybe it's got like some sort of cultish following yep or they could literally just be remote controlled they could be you robots know? yep who knows robots they could be like zombies in in D D are a good example of this because they will just like you can run from some creatures um and other ones will run from you if you like like, like most people are gonna beg for you to not kill them uh instead of fighting to the death but a zombie is not nope zombie will fight to the death because they're already dead so right. it doesn't matter yep. to them and, and they don't really care about anything except for eating you so right and, or or like whatever like whatever or, they do wh- whoever basically whatever who whoever summon them whatever yeah. they want the zombie will do that we'll just do that yeah yeah so i i do you know when it comes to a stealth mission i guess that's one thing is consider the enemy type but also yeah you gotta you gotta slowly you know increase the alertness right so you go from that relaxed to like general alertness um where you know maybe the guard captain happens to be visiting that day uh 
or, or like it's a more strict captain on that day or something. And everybody's like, oh, OK, let's get in ship shape or what, you know, and they're like. Begrudgingly, you know, doing their job better, but they're still doing their job better, <laughs> right? Um, then you go to like the next thing where they hear a noise uh, and it might not be something you could control or it could be a role that you lost. Um, it's good if you don't do all stealth roles. Right. Right. Like that would be great. Um, you want to give your players a variety of different tactics they can use to infiltrate a place. Um, like using acrobatics, like using strength to like break into things. Um, although I don't know how you do that quietly. A sleight of hand maybe to... Mm -hmm. to like to maybe maybe even yeah maybe even sleight of hand maybe they need to like take keys off a guard without mm -hmm. them noticing or performance if you disguise yourself or things like yep, that yep that's a yep. good one so you want to give them multiple ways in um you know what i think i'm gonna have to play a hitman game uh yeah they're 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 pretty fun i haven't tried one um I actually I bought a bunch of them when they were on sale on Steam mm -hmm. and I started playing one and I realized that it wasn't the one that I thought that mm -hmm. I bought. Which made sense when I really thought about it because it was way cheaper than it should have been. <laughs> yeah. And then I realized, oh, yeah, that's right. There was Hitman 2, but then they made another Hitman 2. Or something. I think the last stealth games that I played. Mm hmm were goldeneye 007 and <laughs> okay. mission impossible both for the n64 uh, yeah this yeah n64 games I, i've played a lot of the assassin's creed games but they're not exactly stealth games well that's a good example most of the time in assassin's creed if you drop down in the middle of a crowd you can take them out most of the time there are whoa. yes what dog alarm went off there are definitely times where the crowd you know will take you out especially at earlier levels i think i, I think there's like a level system or something right or you kind of like get skills of? or something i don't know how it, the, it depends on which game uh they're, they're all a little different well which one's the same what which one is not different because that's what i'm thinking of they're all different a little bit the best one was assassin's creed 2 that game was awesome. I haven't liked any of them nearly as much since then. I haven't played all of them. I played Black Flag, which a lot of people said was was their like favorite. They loved it. I didn't like it very much. Um, Do you know what you didn't like about it? Well, I know that I know what most people did like about it, mm -hmm. which was the sailing. They liked sailing a ship. They liked the ship sailing mechanics right. and the stuff you could do on a ship that was my least favorite part about it and that's like most of the game you do that mm. <laughs> uh so that's probably why um but it's even assassin's creed origins which is the one that takes place in ancient egypt mm. not really though because the pyramids are already ancient at the point in the game where the game takes place well the the pyramids are pretty old. They're pretty old, exactly. So it really takes place during like Roman times. Right. Which already I was kind of like, ah, oh, I thought I was playing a game from ancient Egypt. Like ancient, but, ancient. Yeah. yeah, but no, no, it's from it's from way later. Anyway, uh what I don't like about them now is that they throw all of this stuff at for you to do. Mm -hmm. Like they throw all this extra stuff like the mini map is just covered in icons, all of which you can interact with, which to some people gives the game value or whatever. But I just find it annoying because like I really want to do all of it, but none of it's fulfilling. Right. Like I, I do. I, I, I check I check off all of the little things on the map. And at the end of the day, I'm like, I feel hollow inside. Because you are. Like I've done nothing with my life. 
Yeah. Now, well, I, I feel that all the time with side quests in games. Yeah. At, at first, I'm like, all right, I'm going to do some of the side quests. But then eventually I end up doing just the bare minimum to like be a high enough level to beat the game. Right. Um, side quests used to like give you cool stuff like that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Yeah. Now but, I think they just give you points. Well, they end up being necessary to some extent yeah in a lot of game, in a lot of maybe like um jrpgs at least well so i'm I'm thinking of stuff like the xenoblade chronicle series okay where mm -hmm. in those you have to do you don't have to actually you can be a super low level and beat those games if you like kind of really game them but otherwise you generally need to do some side quests or you won't get like incremental armor upgrades or pieces of equipment that you need or stuff like that to to take advantage of your character's abilities. Yeah. It's all it's all so incremental. It's also like you know, it's it's not like you get this super cool extra thing because there are so many side quests that each little one gives you just like a tiny little bit of an upgrade. Like you get there are eight side quests for each character to get each equipment slot upgraded eight times, you know? So there's suddenly 64 side quests for eight different characters, which is however many, you know, hundreds of side quests. Right. And the way that they work in, in Assassin's Creed Origins, mm -hmm. all those like extra side quest things. Yeah. They're, as far as I could tell, they're not really necessary at all. Right. They might unlock the ability to buy certain things. Yeah. Not like microtransaction, but like in game. In game. Yep. Um but uh but the biggest value of them is the same. It's that they level up your character. Yeah. Because that game has a skill tree. Right. So like that you buy you buy skills with skill points. When the you only level problem up. with skill trees a lot of the time is that there's there's very often a branch of the skill tree where if you like go hard into this one branch the game becomes too easy yeah yeah um i always try to branch out pretty nicely mm -hmm. with those you know you know what game does skill trees like a lot of people don't like them in general mm -hmm. but there's a game series that i thought has always done them really well uh borderlands the borderlands games mm -hmm. because you can like not not whenever you want but like sort of whenever you want there's like a i don't know what the term would be for this you know like save points used to be physical in the game like you couldn't just save any time you had to go to a yeah. save point yep it's like that it's like a it's like a thing in the game that you can go to whenever you feel like it mm -hmm. and you can reset all your skill points and oh yeah yeah put them in different things yep. completely if you want to yeah there there are some um actually xenoblade x is one of the games that does that too and i do i love that kind of skill system it, it's it makes sense because otherwise you'll basically have to start the game over if you want to yeah do, you'll it have to do it like 12 times if you want to try all 12 different branches or stuff like that you know right right but yeah but you could go but so you could just like put all your points in one branch and just see what happens, mm -hmm. you know. Use Ghost Walker, and then the twin guns, and then you can beat anything at a really low level in Xenoblade X. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so sometimes it takes like thirty minutes to kill stuff, um, but as soon as you get the whatever boost ability thing it is, you could just you can literally beat anything as long as you don't mess up. 30 minutes of tapping buttons. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know what, cause it, when I was younger, especially mm -hmm. uh, if there was like a skill tree, if any of the options that were available had anything to do with upgrading your health or defense, mm -hmm. I would always do that first. What? I know because I was a wimpy baby. <laughs> oh my God. Who, we, I didn't realize we were this different. Well, because because I, when I was a kid, I thought that dying in a video game was the worst thing that could ever happen <laughs> in the game. Okay, yeah. Like, I felt like that, like, 
I, I did feel similarly for a long time, I, I think. Because when I played like Kingdom Hearts, like one of the first video games I ever played, mm -hmm. I actually don't think I ever died. It was the first video game I ever played. Yeah. I don't think I ever died. Yeah. The for, th like from when I started, but that's because there's a part very early on in Kingdom, the first Kingdom Hearts game where a bunch of Heartless will spawn endlessly. And it was partially because I didn't know what to do. Uh, but I just kept killing them for like I've done that for like an hour. I didn't know what to do. Hour and a half or whatever. Yeah. But but then I got I leveled up to like something. I don't know, like yeah. way more than I needed to be. Mm -hmm. So I was like way too strong for everything. And then um No, that's not true. I definitely did die the first time I played Kingdom Hearts. But the second time I played through it, I knew what to expect and tried really, really hard not to die at all. And I think I did the second time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but uh, yeah, it, it was mostly just like anytime I walked through any area, I killed all the Heartless that spawned, no matter what. Mm hmm everything every time and just doing that maybe way over leveled for the whole game i did stuff like Crazy. that but it was always for attack power i well, would just try to get like the best attacks in pokemon or like all right so one time mm -hmm. i played pokemon blue version and got a level 62 venusaur before i got to brock <laughs> who's the first gym leader <laughs> yep now luckily luckily rock and ground type pokemon like brock has are weak to grass type moves because otherwise i don't know if solar beam would have taken them out in one hit or not <laughs> i mean it's only like tied for the highest no i, I guess i can't say that because of explosion and self-destruct but it's one of the highest power moves in the game and that's what I was all about. All about it. All about those high power moves. Yeah, it was Solar Beam and Hyper Beam were all I cared about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't, um, I didn't, the first Pokemon. Hydro Pump was pretty good too. Fire Blast was okay. Oh yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Uh, I, um, first time I ever played a Pokemon game was in college. Hmm. Which one was it first? I played Leaf Green. Oh, okay. I actually haven't played any since either. Mm-hmm. But um, I did beat Leaf Green. You want to stream a randomizer Nuzlocke? No. Definitely not a randomizer. That would, I don't think I would do well with that. Randomizers are fun. They're fun. They're fun to watch. Mm -hmm. I like watching people play randomizers. All right, I have some homebrew. Do you? Do you have any homebrew? Yeah. Uh, yes. I have some homebrew I'm contemplating for like me to make. To make. To make. Okay. Make it some homebrew in my head. Bruin. So I'm gonna call this it's a it's a monk path. Monks it's a monk subclass, whatever whatever yep. those are called. Yeah. Are they paths? No, that's barbarians. They're, are they called way? Way, the way way of. Way yes. Of. All right. So this one's gonna be called the way of the rod. Okay. All right. Uh not rod Stewart. I was thinking of hot rods, but okay. <gasps> <laughs> Dude, what about like an a, artificer whose whole like deal is that they're mechanic. yeah, no, like an artificer subclass who's who like makes sports car like mm -hmm. muscle cars, like in the Fast and the Furious, Fast and Fur Fast, you know the Fast and Furious series. For for some reason, the thing I thought of was Atlantis, the Lost Empire, and the one girl who always carries around a wrench and yeah. punches people and says two for flinching. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anyway. So the way of the rod. <laughs> yes. So have you read the Dhammapada, the Buddhist holy book? One of them. I may have a long time ago, but it's a small one. It's 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 a perfect holy book because it is so tiny, such a quick read that like you can you can get it. Yeah. You know, one of the chapters in it is called the rod. And it's about the rod. Which is um, rod used Stewart. for striking people. It's oh. a, it's a, like the type of rod that you'd punish somebody with. Okay. Or you'd 
hit an animal with or things like that, like to get them to move or in, in general. Mm -hmm. And the concept uh, behind the rod is that you should not cause you, you shouldn't bring the rod to any creature or cause anyone to do that. So basically you should be vegan is like directly stated in, in Buddhism. Yes. Um, but the way of the rod monk is a type of warrior monk who believes that you should not bring the rod to bear against people, but also does so when necessary. And here's how they work mechanically. This is the fun part. When they, so they, they get, um, they get a bonus to constitution just for being that subclass because when they attack, they take damage based on how much damage they do. They're a high damage output monk. They can do a lot, but they take damage based on how much damage they do. They also can heal and they get healed when they do. So they need to balance you using the rod with, with healing, right? And so basically they need to atone for what they are, are doing, which is against their belief. Um, but they need to do it in combat, <laughs> right? Now, so the way that I'm thinking is the more you attack, the more you're risking yourself. But because you have high damage output, it's worth it to take that risk sometimes to finish something, right? Um, you might be able to incapacitate somebody quickly. And with, you know, somebody down, that's less for everybody to deal with. And then you can start healing people or things like that. But if you go too quickly, you're going to get downed and you'll be a liability for your team. Now, I was also considering that maybe they can only heal if they are missing hit points. So you have to go and like risk yourself in order to, um, you know, uh, heal somebody. And, and I think it's, it's something to do with when they feel the pain of another creature as they hurt it, they can like, they can transform that feeling into the, thing that they used to heal but otherwise they can't do it what do you think interesting yeah it's interesting because okay no it makes sense by the way in real buddhism you can't balance out taking the rod to things with being nice you, you just shouldn't do it but this isn't real Buddhism. I, right. I, I, I just and thought I, I was just, I, I was literally just thinking about that part of the Dhammapada. And I was like, what about in D&D? &D? <laughs> and totally also, it do. just sounds cool. I just like the idea of the rod. I don't know. It's just the translation that I read. Yes. So, um, it, yeah, it, it's it's interesting because I guess when you heal your fellow party members did take damage from somebody, mm -hmm. which means somebody didn't follow the rod otherwise. Right. I, I was worried that like the, it, there would be, it would get all mucked up because you're, you're like causing damage to things, but then healing other people have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. But, maybe it doesn't matter because your whole thing is that you think that hurting is bad. Mm -hmm. So you do it when you need to, if you need to, but also you wouldn't heal something if you felt like it needed to be damaged. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, that's part of a concept in Buddhism too, which is like you, you don't get to determine whether something is good for somebody or not you know like you don't it's it's sai sai wang shur ma i don't remember the tone i i can't speak chinese anymore but mm -hmm. um the the horse of sai wang shur um right like the dude 
has a great horse. It's wonderful. Um, he gets like the best one in his village. Uh, and he's so happy about it. But, well, no, he's not so happy about it. Everyone's like congratulating him. And he's like, well, we'll see. And then his horse runs away and everyone's like, oh, dude, that's that sucks. That, I feel so bad for you. And he's like, well, we'll see. And then it comes back with a beautiful mate and foals. And now he has four amazing horses or whatever. And everyone's like, oh, my God, you're so lucky. And he's like, well, we'll see. <laughs> and his son is riding one of the horses and gets bucked off and breaks his leg. So he's like useless in their farming village. And he like, that's a big problem. His life is, is threatened by it. Right. He like broke his femur or whatever. And everyone's like, oh, dude, this sucks, man. And he's like, well, I don't know. We'll see. And then, uh, like, the regional ruler calls all the men in the village who are able-bodied away to war. And his son can't go. And none of them come back. And he's like, well, <laughs> guess we're seeing. Yeah, <laughs> you, never, you, you, you never know what is, right. is good or bad fortune. Right? Like, you, right. Can't, you can't tell... You can't tell before anything, you know, before it happens, if it's going to be good or bad for you. And if you're that attached to the outcome, like you need it to go a certain way, you're setting yourself up for bad. Basically, it's like kind of their their thought. Yeah. And you know what? I The same. You know, I learned all these lessons from Iron Man, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't get so attached to things. <laughs> it's my board <laughs> uh, sorry yeah drone better uh homebrew yeah 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 um it's a magical item ooh coming to us from Harlequizical. We've had Harlequizical hey, here before. I've seen you around. Harlequizical. Smuggler's coin is what it's called. It's a coin. Okay. Smugglers. Looks like a copper piece. Yeah. But it's got little, little tiny scratches on it, you know? It's like a mm -hmm. scratchy copper piece. Very scratchy. Okay. Yeah. Probably doesn't look much different than most copper pieces. Most of them look like right. that. You ever see a penny? Yeah. Those things I've can get messed up. If you look at the scratches, you'll notice it's in Thieves' Cant, if you know Thieves' Cant, which describes how the coin works. So as an action, a creature holding a coin can tap the coin against an object that fits within a five-foot cube or a willing creature. Okay. Uh, the target is transported to a harmless pocket dimension for 10 minutes. At the end of the duration, the target appears next to the coin in the closest unoccupied space. So it's like a time-sensitive bag of holding. Right. That's coin size. Mm -hmm. If the target object is a container, the coin transports, transports every object inside the container as well. So now you could take a bag of holding. Nope. Weird stuff happens when you put a bag of holding in a pocket dimension. Yeah, I think that's true still. Anyway. Um, it... But it, but it transports all the objects inside the container as well. Mm -hmm. Once the target has been transported, the coin cannot be used again in this way for 12 hours. In addition, the coin can't be targeted by any divination, magic, or perceived through magical scrying sensors. So, it's a, yeah, it's a smuggler's coin. It's for smuggling. Yep. People can't even look at the stuff that's in it. Yeah. The fact that it only works for 10 minutes seems a little low. Yeah, it's, I like I like that for the stakes of it, right? Like you have to get in there within 10 minutes now. Can't, right. You, you, you have to somehow act natural walking through the border or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and, and not get stopped for more than 10 minutes because you're going to have a problem then. Or you could just throw the coin somewhere. At some point during that, but that's not really that natural. People would be a little bit like, whoa, what was that all about? Yeah, you could try to throw it over the wall. Yep. 
Oh man, put Can you throw it into a portable hole. I mean, I don't see why not. No, no, no. A portable hole just goes through stuff. That's not what I was thinking of. I was thinking of the other thing that leads to a pocket dimension. Yeah, a portable hole can be used to store things. No, that is. Oh, you, yeah, you're you, right. You were thinking of yeah, the right yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I forgot. It can go through stuff, but it can also, yeah, just lead to. You like you can put it on the ground, and it basically creates like a ditch. Mm -hmm. Like it does have a bottom. Yeah. And also, you can put stuff in the ditch and take the hole, and it's in the thing. Mm -hmm. I only know that because I once read a story about a D and D game where the players found like a skull, and it had like a cloth hanging out of his eyeball mm -hmm. in in like the office of some like yakuza type dude. And they took the skull and they like pawned it off. They like sold it for like a couple hundred gold. And it was the DM telling the story. And he was like, little did they know that the silk cloth in the eyeball was actually a portable hole that had all of the Yakuza guys gold in it. Like, like, ten, like some crazy amount, like a hundred thousand gold pieces or whatever. Yeah. Uh. That's the that so quick topic there. Yeah. Um when you give the players loot. Yeah. Just give them like a general idea of what's there cuz describing loot all day that's the most boring thing ever. Yeah. But be ready if they ask about it. Yeah. You know, be be ready to like supply some details that make it and, and the more interested they are, the more interesting you can make it. It doesn't have to be powerful because they were interested it just has to be interesting interesting yeah right like they were wondering about this cloak and then you're like oh you know what actually that fur looks familiar that it's made of doesn't that look a little familiar and they're like oh uh no yeah <laughs> uh sure and I you're mean, like oh well i mean that's you know the fur of some kind of bison that's native to where you're from isn't that weird that it's where we are now? And then they're like, huh. And you're like, actually, wait a second. If you notice the like the stitching of it, you might have seen that before. And it turns out maybe that it's something that somebody you know made Bel or, something. or belonged to or them. Or belonged yeah. to somebody you know. Yeah. So it could be stuff like that, or it could just be fancy. It could just be like, all right, yeah, it's got this cool it's gold got, trim. It's got fancy. There's yeah. like gold leaf on this thing. It's like, and they're like, oh, what about this? And you're like, oh, well, it's also got pockets. And yeah, they're each a pocket dimension. You put your hands in and you can't find the bottom. <laughs> they have robes like that. What's it called? It's like a robe of stuff or something like that. <laughs> where it's literally like it's a robe that has patches on it and you like pull the patches off as an action and it turns into something yeah. like whatever, whatever is depicted. Mm -hmm. Like literally one of them is like, you can throw it on. The, it's like Pokemon. You can like throw it on the ground and it turns into a Mastiff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stuff like that's fun. They should make a game where you can have stuff like that. A game where you can have stuff like that? Yeah, like you you play as, you know, people who have cool robes like that or whatever. Okay. They should make a game like that. Like D&D? &D? What is these words? Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. These words mean nothing to me. Well, it's a game. Mm-hmm. 